As you begin your study of chapter 2, you'll be introduced to the concept of economics. Now e economics itself is a fairly complex topic and uh, this chapter and this course just gives you a brief, brief introduction to economics and very likely as you continue in your degree we'll actually take uh, full semester classes on uh, micro and or perhaps both uh, macro and micro economics and of course there's advanced topics of economics as well but we'll just discuss some of the basics in this chapter. You'll discover as you read this chapter that there are two major branches of economics, macroeconomics and microeconomics. Macroeconomics focuses on economies as a whole. For instance, the entire U.S. economy would be considered macroeconomics, and that would be, you know, how does the U.S. spend its money, uh, what is the total overall gross domestic product, uh, what is the tax rate, what is the fiscal policy. Microeconomics specifically concentrates on individuals and organizations in particular markets. For instance, uh, you know, what is the supply of gasoline? And how does the supply of gasoline affect the price? And how does the price affect how much gasoline uh, individuals or consumers are willing to buy? And we'll discuss that a little bit more as uh, we get further into this chapter. But uh, again, macro is economies in, as a whole, and micro would be individual uh, markets. As you read in the chapter, you'll learn that economics has often been called the dismal science. And that's because it studies the fact that we want more than our resources allow us to produce. And I always learned that uh, when I first learned about economics is that uh, we have, in general, um, unlimited wants, but there are limited resources. I mean, I would like a larger car, I would like a bigger house, uh, but resources are limited. And so economics is the study of how individuals and corporations and of course economies in, as a whole deal with resources and unlimited wants. When you read the chapter and study the chapter you'll you'll be introduced to a few names. You'll be introduced to Malthus and Keynes and Adam Smith and uh, they're important and uh, you know they may show up on a quiz. Um, Adam Smith um, actually was known as the father of economics and uh, he explained the concept of capitalism. And capitalism is where all or most of the land, uh, the businesses and the factories are owned by individuals, not the government. And the key here, as we discussed in chapter one, those businesses are operated for a profit. And of course, there are many countries with capitalist foundations, uh, the United States, England, and as you can see here. In order for capitalism to exist, there are four rules or basic rights that, uh, that must exist also in the nation. Number one is the right to own private property. You must have the right to be able to buy and sell your property. Uh, the right to own a business and keep all the business's profits to reinvest or to compensate the owners. Uh, the right for freedom of competition. If I want to start selling apples on the street corner and someone else already has, well, I have the right to do that in a capitalist society. And of course the right for freedom of choice. I can buy what I want to buy. I can choose this car or that car. So those are the four basic rights within capitalism. Another concept within economics is the, uh, the, the concept of a free market. And in a free market, uh, the decisions are made about uh, you know how much I should produce as a, as a company, or what I can buy, or how much I have to buy, or will buy, or willing to buy by consumers, uh, is made by the market. And you know a good example would be uh, commodities such as uh, you know corn and wheat. Uh, you know the price is set by the market. Um, the farmer decides how much grain he's going to produce by and what grain he's going to produce by what he predicts the market cost will be. And of course, if the cost of uh, wheat goes up, then people start using substitutes. And so that's the concept of a free market. Within economics, you'll also learn about supply curves and demand curves. And quite simply, the supply is the quantity that uh, a business or a farmer is going to produce or willing to produce at a different price. And uh, if you're from uh, the area around here uh, in, in the Palouse, you'll see a lot of grain silos. And a lot of what you see in those grain silos are farmers waiting for a price uh, to hit a certain point before they release the, the grain and so they're holding that grain until the price goes up and as the price goes up well they're willing to sell a lot more grain uh, and so the higher the price the more grain they're willing to produce or release from their uh, silos. Now the demand curve acts in the exact opposite way of the supply curve. In the supply curve the higher the price the more the producer was willing to supply. Well on the other hand for the demand curve, consumers 
are willing to buy less at higher prices. And of course, a good example of this would be gasoline. If gasoline rises a dollar a gallon, uh, you're going to do whatever you can to use less. And on the other hand, if gasoline goes down to 50 cents a gallon, well, you're not going to mind getting that bigger car or taking that larger vacation. And so the supply curve, the higher the price, the more is produced. The demand curve, the higher the price, the less they will purchase. Another very important concept within economics is the equilibrium point. And the equilibrium point is where the demand curve and the supply curve actually intersect. That's the price where the amount that consumers are willing to pay and the amount that producers are willing to get meet. At this point, uh, there is a profitability, some profitability for the producers, and uh, the consumers um, negotiate the price. And a good example of this, again, would be commodities. Uh, the market determines the price, and as the price goes up, there's more supplied, and so on. So where the two meet, the supply curve and the demand curve meet at that particular price, that's known as the equilibrium point, where the supply and the demand and the price meet. With true capitalism, um, every market is a free market, and there are very few nations uh, that have that anymore. Uh, even the United States has a, kind of a mixed economy because the government does control some aspects of, of business and regulates things, and which takes us into socialism. Socialism is an economic system in which businesses, small businesses, can be run by entrepreneurs, but larger businesses like utilities and uh, even some production are owned by the government itself. Uh, within socialism, citizens are, are taxed very highly, and the government is involved with uh, you know, making many, many decisions about health and uh, many other economic decisions as well. As you read the text, in addition to capitalism and socialism, you'll also be introduced to the concept of communism. Within communism, the government makes all economic decisions. And that kind of leads us to where we are today. Um, communist governments are kind of disappearing. There are very few uh, true communist governments left. And uh, socialist governments are kind of becoming more capitalistic. And capitalist countries are becoming a little bit more socialist. So we're, we're kind of all merging in the middle here. Okay, that was just a brief introduction to the concepts in this chapter. So you will want to read the chapter, study the chapter, uh, take the chapter quiz, and of course, any other assignments that are part of your syllabus uh, for this particular chapter.